Hello there, everybody. Happy Friday. Thank you for joining me. My name is Ashley Hunt. I'm the Senior Project Management Instructor here at Storman Studios. And today we're going to be doing a webinar on agile and tailoring and some good information of the Agile Certified Practitioner, which we'll talk about a little bit. But before we get started, just do me a favor and chat in and let me know. Do you practice any kind of Agile? Are you new to Agile? Are you thinking about getting certified? Give me some information on what types of roles you're working in as far as Agile is concerned. If you're like, I don't know anything about Agile or I've heard of it, but I've never used it, that's okay too. We're gonna to go through some of the high level, you know, best practices of an Agile project. We're going to use one of the frameworks called Scrum. Maybe you've heard of Scrum. Brand new to Agile, just curious on what it is. Awesome, hi John. Uh, just starting to move from waterfall to hybrid. Hi Bob. Kanban, coaching manager certified. Awesome WB. Brand new, Agile question mark. Yes, uh, we try but we're hybrid though. You know, it's. I hear that all the time. A lot of times, if you are going hybrid, it's like, is it from the top down where the organization says, hey, let's do this agile thing, we've heard of it, or is it more bottom up? Yeah, no formal training. Today's, like I said, today is one hour uh, maximum, but we will go through some of the high level types of information that you can expect to see in an agile class on an agile project, those types of things. And a question did come in, you used to do Scrum? Well, there you go. We're going to use Scrum as sort of the baseline of best practices. If you're not familiar with what Scrum is, that's okay. Scrum is one of the frameworks under the Agile umbrella. It's probably one of the most popular frameworks out there. And usually it gets utilized as sort of that framework to follow best practices, whether it's hybrid, generic, I mean, right now, these days, knowing how to tailor to be able to look at your projects and go, what is going to be best utilized or benefit the team and the project? And Agile is not just for software development anymore. So today we're going to go through just a, a bit of an overview of the frameworks that we cover in the Agile Certified Practitioner class. How many of you are familiar with the Project Management Institute or PMI, the PMP Certified Associate in Project Management. You might not be aware that they have an Agile Certified Practitioner. Yes, yes, lots of yeses coming in. The uh, PMI ACP class slash certification is, uh, it's been around for several years when the Project Management Institute started to recognize that, you know, uh, people are starting to do less predictive in some industries and more agile or hybrids. And so they put together the Agile Certified Practitioner exam. And uh, since then, now the PMP is absolutely, you know, 50% agile and 50% predictive. You abandoned PMI for Kanban? Well, what's fascinating about that is that the Project Management Institute has now recognized that agile is a big deal. So the PMP exam is now 50%, as mentioned, 50% agile and 50% predictive or what waterfall project management. And so the expectation is that project managers have, you know, the skill sets and a lot of different types of frameworks. So we'll talk about the frameworks that we cover in the class. The reason why I'm using the ACP as sort of a, a blanket example is because a lot of people will take that class just for best practices. In Agile, some of you said no formal training, kind of new to it, organizations going a bit more hybrid. And what's cool about the ACP, the class, not necessarily the certification, some people just take the class for information. But what's cool about it is it covers a variety of different frameworks, including Kanban, <laughs> Lean, Kanban, Scrum, Extreme Programming, and some of the others that are out there, as well as scalable systems like Safe and Disciplined Agile and Large Scale Scrum. And the good news about that is not only do we go through the frameworks, but we also go through the best practices in each framework. Part of what we're going to be covering today is a little snippet of what we cover in that class. So we'll talk about daily stand-up meetings, we'll talk about the power of retrospectives, a little bit of Kanban, but the, I mean, we have one hour, <laughs> so there's no way we could cover 
everything. But if you are interested in taking the class or even potentially the certification after the fact, we'll talk about that as well. But do me a favor and let me know what industry you're in and what your job role is. A lot of times, very first day of classes, we'll talk about the different industries that everybody's in, what their roles or responsibilities are. Some people are brand new to project management or agile, and that's okay uh, for sure. But one of the reasons why I ask is that in class, I try and utilize your industries to give you examples of how they might work, you know, how, how these best practices might work in your industry. So we've got uh, education, healthcare, IT, IT business intelligence, public education, education PM, automotive IT project manager, hybrid agile wannabe. And you know, not every single project can we utilize full-blown predictive or full-blown agile. That's why there's so many hybrids out there. Um, thank you, state government project manager. And that's that's pretty it's kind of standard. I get a lot of IT, a lot of education, a lot of government, uh, and some software development, that kind of thing. But uh, social and health services network analyst, SQL servers, awesome. Yeah, you know, Agile for a lot of people feels like up oh, flavor of the month. It just started. Uh, it's this this new thing. When in actuality, Agile, Scrum, and some of these other frameworks that we talk about started in the 90s. Where were you in 1995? <laughs> don't please don't say kindergarten. But 1990s, that's when, you know, we were starting to go from this industrial age to a more technological age. And even though we were still pretty firmly in that industrial age for project management anyway, you know, organizations were trying to figure out how can we automate our systems? How do we automate payroll? You're in primary school. Me too. No, <laughs> I was not, but that's that's okay. But uh, so a lot of software developers were trying to navigate all of this new technology, develop software to automate mm, assembly lines or automate payroll. 95 just got out of the Marine Corps Communication Center's beginning of lands. Well, thank you for your service. Yeah. And so, you know, you think about back then, even just Y2K in early 2000, it was like ah, 1999. It's the end of technology as we know it. And so trying to automate these systems, software developers were finding the bulkiness, if you will, of a predictive or a waterfall type of project management just wasn't working. It was very difficult to like front load a plan and follow that plan. And they were like, oh no, this isn't working. You know, we need to have it a bit more iterative or incremental. And so 17 software developers got together in Snowbird, Utah in 2001. This was not their first meeting. Yeah, you can't react efficiently. Exactly. It's like, ugh. You know, we just compounded a problem in the software because we thought it was going to go this way and it didn't. And so that was the, the struggle was real. The struggle was real. So they got together and they formed what's called the Agile Alliance. And part people that are involved in the Agile Alliance, even still today, are the people that created Scrum and Extreme Programming and some of these other frameworks. And so when they formed the Agile Alliance, they said, all right, we need to have something that's standardized but at the same time, be able to adapt and adjust to this ever-changing landscape of software development, hardware, just this technological age that we find ourselves in. And we need to have the ability to have iterative and incremental types of planning. And thus, the Agile Manifesto was born. Now, sometimes organizations will find themselves in this situation of, hey, Agile's, you know, new, or let's try this, or I hear it really works, and then recognize that potentially it's not going to work for the types of products and services that the organization is building. However, I always find that people, even in that hybrid realm, even if it's bottom up, like meaning somebody learns how a stand-up meeting is effective or a retrospective might work out well, and they incorporate that into their projects. Sometimes your stakeholders don't get it. Like they, they don't understand at where's my Gantt chart? What do you mean I don't have a baseline to follow and so on? And so you get stuck in that messy middle ground of, 
we want to use best practices, but we can't go fully agile. And that's why a lot of hybrids are out there today. So the Agile Manifesto was really a way of saying, we are a group of software developers who value this over that. It's not this over that, but at the same time, it's individuals and interactions over processes and tools. Those of you that do practice Agile, they're processes and tools, right? I mean, we're, it's not like we're not utilizing tools and best practices and things like that. We are. But look, if somebody knows something, they use their empirical knowledge, they're like, yeah, everything's a process. Exactly. But let's say somebody comes to the team or comes to the table with a better way of doing the same things or says, hey, why don't we try this instead? I, I, I think that this is going to be better. The best practices in predictive are sort of like, no, <laughs> this has worked forever. We're not changing it, or we've always done things this way. We're not going to change how we're doing things. And everybody goes, okay, all right, we'll keep doing it. But in this case, if we can have individuals and interactions that lead to better ways of doing things, let's be open to that. Working software or working whatever over comprehensive documentation, putting together a front-loaded heavy plan that we know is going to change might not work, it is a waste of time. The goal is to try and produce something, as we'll see, iteratively over and over and over again of value. And it doesn't mean that we don't document. <laughs> I mean, there's no way that you can't document. Some of you are in government. Some of you are in healthcare, IT documentation. We still have to document. But what we're not going to do is put together this front-loaded heavy plan, this project management plan with all these baselines. The other aspect of this is customer collaboration over contract negotiation. You know, contract, well, that's, we don't want to breach contract and so on. But in an agile approach, we want more flexibility in procurement so that we can make changes. Yeah, document instead of prediction, and that's why they call it predictive. We know if we're going in to build a bridge, we're going to have a bridge when we're finished. Not a skyscraper, not a bicycle, a bridge. And so we can heavily plan for that, execute it, and if things go sideways, we use that formal change control and update the plans. That's predictive. That's why they call it that. Where agile, adaptive, allows for more malleability, being open to change. And that's the last one, responding to change over following a plan. Documentation happens at what we call the last responsible moment. Okay, this is the, as forward as we're going. Let's go with that. So it's not, and, and a lot of what we talk about in the ACP class or what we'll talk about just conversations in class are things like, well, again, my stakeholders don't get it. Where's my baseline? And how do I answer this question? And how do I, how do I be agile? Don't necessarily need to do agile, but how do I practice agility? A lot of the uh, frameworks, if you will, that created, you know, different ways of doing work are things like Scrum and Extreme Programming. These are the frameworks that we talk about in the ACP class and go through all of them, some of which ha still have a little bit of one foot on the predictive, one foot in the agile because it was, you know, early 2000s, late 90s, early 2000s. Feature-driven development, adaptive software development, crystal, dynamic systems. And then we have Lean and Kanban. Kanban and Lean are contributors to both predictive and agile. And we'll, we'll talk about Kanban a little bit here, where it started. You know, where did it come from? You might have heard of Lean Manufacturing, Lean Six Sigma. I mean, Lean and Kanban have been around, you know, early, early, 40s. 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, and so they are contributing factors to project management just in general, but how they affect Agile. And I, I love Kanban. I practice something called Scrumbon, which sounds like a really funny word. But uh, we'll talk a little bit more about Scrum and Kanban as we go. First of all, Scrum is a rugby term. Uh, if anybody familiar with rugby, Scrum is a rugby term. And essentially what it is, is 
Yeah, you are. I know you are, WB. A uh, scrum is when the team, the scrum gets together, the rugby team, and links arms and works together to move the ball down the field. So it's not like a quarterback, you know, you know, throw the ball and to somebody who's a receiver. No, the entire team is working together. There isn't really what you might consider hierarchy in true scrum. Everybody on the team is on the same level. They all have the role to play, but they're all working together to get to that point where we score the goal. You are too, yeah. So the scrum life cycle, if you want to just turn it to more generic agile, it would be instead of sprint planning, it would be iteration planning. Those of you that are in hybrid, those of you that are practicing agile, how long are your iteration slash sprints? Now, the word sprint, think about sprint, you run really quickly, but you don't get very far. Most agile projects are planned in two-week iterations or four-week iterations. And I'm seeing a lot more two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, two. Every two weeks we plan, we produce something that's usable and valuable and releasable. But if you think about it from the perspective of just simple software development, somebody wants you to build them a very simple word processing software. Type spell check print, you know. So we'd plan for two weeks and produce type and release it, test it, get it approved. And then we do spell check. And instead of doing the entire software program and releasing it at the end, like you might see in a predictive environment. So sprint and iteration are interchangeable unless you're talking actually about scrum. We'll look at a daily scrum or daily standup meeting. Anybody doing standups? 15 minute daily meetings. If not, a lot of times people will leave the PMP or the ACP class and say, you know, that might be something that we should do. The review, basically at the end of every sprint or iteration, it's a demo. Here's what we've created. Let's have a conversation about what we're going to do next and what we have created. And then retrospectives, which we'll look at. How about lessons learned meetings? Anybody doing lessons learned on my predictive side or more, my more high, agile, hybrid-ish side? If you're doing lessons learned, lessons learned is when the project is over, right? Yes to lessons learned, right? And so if, if the project is over, it's really in a lot of ways too late to go back. It's like, ouch, that was painful. You try, yeah, ouch, ouch. Uh, uh, did we fix it as we were going through? But yet a retrospective is a way of looking back. LL is done during retros. I gotcha. There you go. Lessons learned is done during the retrospectives. So the way that I, I try and explain the differences between agile and predictive is two different ways. I'll give you two different examples. First example, how many of you have little kids where they've got sports and sleepovers and school and they've got all sorts of activities that they do throughout the year, right? It would be like sitting down and planning out your child's entire year. Every single soccer game, every single, you know, team meeting conference with their parent, you know, with their teachers and all of that in one go. There's no way. There's no way you could do it because things change, right? But could you plan out the next two weeks of your child's life? Yes. It's easier. And then we look back at that last two weeks and say, all right, how do we do? What's the next two weeks look like? Another way of, of trying to look at this is from the perspective of maybe art. The difference between agile and predictive. Maybe you're an amazing artist. You've been commissioned to paint a painting. And if you're going to run it in a predictive manner, you collect all the requirements from the customer and they say, oh, you know, I want my favorite beach scene and I want palm trees and I want sun and I want beautiful water and all of that. You collect the requirements. You paint the painting. And when you're finished with the painting, you give it to the customer and say, here you go. Now, one of two things is going to happen. They're either going to say, that's perfect, or they're going to say, where's the beach ball? And you're like, don't, oh, defect repair. Go back and change it. Go back and fix it. In that predictive environment, you're producing everything up front and releasing at the end. In an agile environment, you would first sketch out the scene with the customer and say, is this, you know, looking good? And they're like, ah, can you put a seagull over there? And you're like, sure. 
We're sketching out. Sketch looks good. Yes? Yes. All right, great. Next time we're just going to work on the blues. So we're going to paint all the blues and then we're going to show you the blues and you're going to let us know, is that working? Is that work for you? You want to change anything? You want to add anything? Okay, no. Next sprint iteration, we're going to work on the greens and you iteratively release pieces, parts of that final result until it gets to that point where the customer goes, it's done. That's really the difference between agile and predictive. Now, in some cases, when we're looking at an agile project, and, and I try and keep it generic because everybody's in different industries, the goal is to plan for the short term, for two weeks, release something. Plan the next two weeks, release something. And every single day during a two-week sprint or iteration, we're doing what are called stand-up meetings. And some of you are 10 to 30 minutes, depending on <laughs> what's going wrong, what's going sideways. But if you've ever sat in a weekly meeting or numerous meetings throughout the week, and it's just like ugh, circular conversations and ah, this is terrible with your team, what we're trying to do is eliminate the need to have these weekly hour, two hour long status meetings with our team. And instead, every single day at the same time, same place, and usually it's time box for about 15 minutes, but it, you guys do you, you can, you can make them as long or short as you need them to be. But in general, it's supposed to be 15 minutes where the team gets together and says, all right, individually, what did I do yesterday to help the team meet the goal? What am I going to do today to help the team meet the goal? And what impediments are in my way? What are some of the speed bumps that I'm coming up against? Now, here's the difference. The difference is it's not a solution-oriented meeting. It's informational only because the team is going to disperse and go work through solutions and everybody's up to date on what everybody else is doing. How many of you are still virtual or are you hybrid or back in the office? Because I know some people are, are still virtual and they do daily Zoom meetings, you know, daily sit down for 15 minutes. But do you, are you back in the office? Are you hybrid? Are you like virtual? Yeah, because I'm seeing a lot of hybrids come in too on uh, my classes. Oh, you've always been in the office? Uh, teleworking back in the office, unfortunately. Back in the office. Yeah, never really left. That's a bummer, Greg. If you never really left, and, and that's a lot for a lot of people, industry specific also, but sometimes people are still virtual or they're teleworking. They're like, I don't really know how, you know, how could we do that? But we have Zoom, we have Teams, those kinds of things to have those daily 15 minute interactions. And usually they happen first thing in the morning. Now, remember, I only have an hour. <laughs> so going through all the nuances of, of Agile and user stories and so on, we cover all of that in class. I teach you how to size user stories. We talk about something called planning poker. I'm just giving you the bare bones. But how many of you do use user stories? Or do you have deliverables or requirements that you more collect using Gantt charts or outlines, that kind of thing? Anybody using user stories? User stories are a way of presenting a feature or a function or an increment or a result in story format. Use epics, feature stories, and tasks. Yeah, you got that. You got this. We'll talk about epics just a little bit if you're not familiar with the terminology. But user stories are a way of presenting, we'll just call it a requirement for, just keep it simple, instead of a laundry list of deliverables or requirements, instead, we're going to describe it. As an end user, amateur photographer, beach lover, whatever it is, I need or want this feature or function so that I can do or so that I get instead of individual activities that roll up into one big deliverable. A laundry list of, of requirements may not be the easiest to navigate, duration estimate, you know, resource assignments, things like that. Whereas on the Agile side, the user stories allow us to have a better understanding of who we're building it for, what we're building and why. Uh, yes, I try and get the team to do so, but they're not interested. The user stories, and you know what? Sometimes these things just won't work. It's an ongoing back. And you know, one of the, the biggest things that I hear from people in class is either the team's not into it, 
they've never done it before. You know, that transition to agile feels like, yeah, adults don't really like change. We're not a huge fan of change. Um, but the other aspect of that is that maybe your stakeholders don't get it. And there's this, this like pushback on what the stakeholders want versus how we want. But then they wonder what to test. <laughs> yeah, if you don't know what you're building, why you're building it and what it is, how do you test it exactly? And so user stories are in place of, you know, as a I need or want so that I can do or so that I get. And one of the differences, but like how many of you use Gantt charts? How many of you are sequencing tasks, activities? What software are you using? And it doesn't even have to be Gantt chart. Are you using Microsoft Project? Are you using Smartsheet? Are you using Trello? You might not even know if you're using 365 that you've got an app called Planner. You've got Project and Smartsheet, MS DevOps. That makes sense. But uh, Project and Smartsheet, Team Dynamics. Right now, Chris, and I'm not sure what version you've got, but both Project and Smartsheet have a card view. And check and see if you have the card view. Use Teams Planner. I like Asana too. Uh, Jira. Yeah, so you all have that capability with Asana, Jira, and Teams Planner um, to utilize what we're going to take a look at, a Scrum board versus a Kanban board. It's a visual way of representing workflow. Very different. Trello is terrible. It is if, you've, if you need more in-depth. If you're brand new to Agile or you're brand new to task boards, it's really a good, it's like planner in its simplicity. It's a really kind of good way to get your feet wet with using what are called task boards. We'll just keep it simple. But what is this scrum board? So uh, WB, Teams Planner. I like Teams too. And if you're like, I don't know what that is, if you use 365, you've got an app called Planner. You do have to download it uh, unless it's already on your system, but it's basically the same representation of using a whiteboard with post-it notes, if you will. And when you look at a scrum board, essentially, just imagine you know, swim lanes of to do, doing, and done. Now, trust me, I mean, I was a predictive project manager for years. I was a product of Microsoft Project, Smartsheet, all of those things, scheduling. And when I finally started to use Scrum boards, task boards, Kanban boards, they're all, they all similarly function. It completely changed the way that I look at scheduling forever, forever. And so just imagine you've got this whiteboard and let's say post-it notes, whether they're digital or not, post-it notes. And on each post-it note, you have a little blurb about what it is that you're building. This is what I'm building, this is why, and this is for who. And those individual user stories, or even tasks, if you will, totally up to you how you use this. You do you. But the goal is to look at workflow from left to right. And so the epics were brought up, user stories are brought up, and trust me, we go through all of this in class. But epics are, for example, what is your favorite group of movies, television shows with like multiple seasons? Is it Game of Thrones? Are you a Star Wars fan? Do you like the Die Hard movies? House of Dragon? Which, what's your favorite? The Marvel Universe? Just chat in and let me know because when we talk about epics, it's a good way of explaining. So for example, let's say it's House of Dragon or Game of Thrones or something like that. Harry Potter. My nerd is totally showing right now. Um, but let's say somebody walked up to me on the street never having seen anything or read any of the books of Game of Thrones and said, explain it to me. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, uh, there's you know, a bunch of different families and they're fighting over this and there's cool, there's dragons. Right, Batman, there you go, Greg. And conceptually, it's like, well, that should be kind of easy to explain. A dark superhero, but he doesn't really have superhero powers, but he's got cool gear. And people are like, wait, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? It's too epic. It's too big. It's too obtuse. And so even in predictive project management, we're dealing with big deliverables that have to get broken down to the point where we can say, all right, we can estimate that. We can resource that. 
because it's still too big. Same concept in, in Agile and Epic is a large user story that's too obtuse that needs to be broken down to that point where we can better estimate its size or duration. You can use durations too. Some teams will even break the user stories down to the task level. There's no wrong way. This The goal is workflow. It's a visual workflow where you're pulling work from, let's say, to do into doing and to done. And we're in sales. Hey, that's cool too. So the very first time I ever saw uh, a task board, scrum board, or Kanban board, I was in a manufacturing plant. I was in Shenzhen, China, and I was there for work. And I saw it was a digital Kanban board or task board. And I said, what, what is that? And they said, ah, oh, it's Kanban. <laughs> what, what is that? <laughs> and they were like, here, watch. And I just watched workflow across, you know, the, the iteration, if you will, and thought, oh my gosh, that's so easy to read. Gantt charts are not that easy to read. If you don't know how to read a Gantt chart, you haven't seen one in a while, it's like, hmm. Because your brain can process visual images 60,000 times faster than text. Just imagine if you have a list of all the things that you want to accomplish for the week. You're like laundry, uh, grocery shopping, those kinds of things. But you don't need to drill it down to your actual grocery list right now and you put it in the to-do column. And then when you're ready to do it, you put it into doing or work in progress. And when it's done, you move it to done. Any of you like uh, checklists where you cross things off? Are you a list writer, list crosser offer? Because if so, this gives you that same sort of, ooh, <laughs> I get it, it's a work in progress, it's done. Um, because it's that visual of pulling workflow from left to right. You know how I've seen this work pretty well, especially during the pandemic, was when uh, help desk teams went virtual. And so they would use Planner, they'd use something like that, at, you know, whatever board. It could have been, you know, visual if they were in the office, could have been an actual whiteboard. But they used Microsoft Planner to document tickets that were coming in. They would color code them, red, yellow, green. You know, red's like, ah, I gotta deal with this right now. And they would all log in to the same board and be able to see the workflow as it was getting accomplished so that they didn't duplicate tickets, they didn't miss anything. And originally, this entire process flow, if you will, started with Kanban. So we'll look at Kanban more often and get accomplished endorphins. I know, I like, cause that's, for me, I've got an actual whiteboard in my office and I, I've got a post-it note problem. My name is Ashley, I've got a post-it note problem. I like them, but it does, it gives you that little, ooh, <laughs> rather than I just marked that at 100%. But where did this all begin? Kanban started after World War II at Toyota. And so Japan was trying to repair their economy after World War II and set up their systems. And so what they did is they came, some representatives from Toyota came to Detroit and, to see what the car manufacturers were doing in Detroit. And while they were here, there, they went to an American grocery store and they saw people shopping. So imagine when you go to the store and you open up the orange juice, you know, uh, refrigerator and you pull the orange juice and thunk, another one comes down. If you're ready for another one, you can pull it. If not, you can come back a week later and thunk, pull it towards you. It, the goal is to make sure that you have what you need. The work is being pulled into progress when you're ready for it. Have you ever seen that? Um, I used to watch I Love Lucy with my grandmother all the time. She loved I Love Lucy. Have you ever seen that episode where Lucy and Ethel are working at the chocolate factory <laughs> and everything's fine. It's coming down one at a time and they're wrapping it and putting it in the basket. And then all of a sudden the chocolate just comes flying down the assembly line and their stuff, it's classic, right? And they're stuffing it in their pocket and in their mouth and in their hand. It's too much work in progress. 
There's too much work. We can't get it all done. That's the best visual that I can give you of having that pull system. You don't have too much work in progress. You pull it to, towards you when you're ready. So what Toyota was doing was trying to figure out supply chain, you know, control logistical um, supply chain from the production point so that there wasn't too much work in progress because that's how defects happen. That's how you know, rework happens. They wanted to create a system and did create a system, but Kanban you know, is a logistical supply chain. So same thing, now, it's used all the time now in buying anything. So you go and you buy that, that OJ, they scan it. One goes into inventory, someone else buys it, scan it. Another one goes into inventory. So they're not Obviously, with food, you have expiration dates and so on, but so that there's nothing stored in the back anymore. When I was a kid, if they didn't have your shoe size, you'd ask them to check in the back. Now they're like, what are you talking about in the back? No, we sell all of our size fives. We'll replace them. But same thing with that, that process flow of that board, the Kanban cards, keys, post-it notes, digital post-it notes, whatever you want to use to signal the need to move materials. It allows for optimizing workflow. And that way you don't have too many chocolates coming down the line. It's that concept of keeping work in progress limited sounds counterintuitive. But if you're focused on the work and you move it to done and then you pull more work in and you move it to done, I don't know about you, but I'm not the world's greatest multitasker. I find it very difficult to jump around and, uh, you know, some people can, but for me to pull work in, get it done, move it to done, pull more, I actually get more work done. And that's a similar concept. It's cool. I, I, I enjoy using <laughs> Kanban. For some, there's a lot out there, like I said, Smartsheet and new versions of Project. If you look in the views, if it says card view, you also have the option to build it in the Gantt chart side and it will generate on the card side or you create the card post-it notes and it will generate on the Gantt chart side of things because some hybrids are like, okay, well, let's start with user stores or let's start with this before we start linking dependencies and so on. Let's, let's just get our ducks in a row. Now, retrospective, several of you said, yeah, we do lessons learned. Maybe some of you document lessons learned all the way through, or you have issue logs or things that you go through. But generally, the thought is that when the project is over, we have a lessons learned meeting. And that at that point is too late. Project's over. Whereas on the agile side of things, every two weeks, a retrospective is happening, if that's your iteration length, every two weeks or every four weeks, whatever it is. But there is a meeting to talk about what should we keep doing? What should we stop doing? What should we change? The value of a retrospective is exponential. Like you can't even, be, here's a good example. I, I know I have some scrum masters in here too, right? People have gone or practiced scrum. But when I went to my scrum master training, we were in a classroom at the time and went through you know the days of training and then at the end of the training our instructor said look i want to show you the value of retrospectives so what i'm going to do is i'm going to break you up into teams of five people each team of five is going to get two paint buckets one bucket's going to be filled with golf balls one bucket's going to be completely empty your job is to work together as a team to get as many golf balls from the full bucket to the empty bucket. Here's the rules. I'll give you two minutes to plan this, two minutes to actually execute it. Every single person on the team has to touch the golf ball. The first person to touch it is the one to put it in the bucket. If it hits the floor, it doesn't count, and you can't pass it to either people on either side of you. And then after that, I'll give you two minutes to retrospective. First sprint iteration, we got like five or six balls into the bucket. It was terrible. People were dropping the balls and we just didn't have our plan. It wasn't working. So we got together, we regrouped, we changed our strategy. We had a retrospective. The next time we doubled our output. We had 12 or 13 golf balls in the bucket. After six sprints or iterations, 
we had almost 70 golf balls in that bucket. Same team, same rules, same time frame. But we exponentially changed our ability to execute work together as a team and get more done in the same amount of time. And that is the value of a retrospective, the ability to regroup every two weeks or every month, it depends on how you know long your sprints or iterations are, to really discuss what went well, what did not go so well, what are we going to change, what are we going to stop doing, how are we going to fail faster and succeed sooner. Now, who knows? Had we kept going, we might have been able to do better than that, but there's a certain point where the team capability or capacity hits a wall. That's the maximum amount that we can do in two minutes. That's when we're like, okay, now what else can we focus on to improve? Maybe improve how we do our retrospectives, improve our daily stand-up meetings, how we communicate, whatever the case may be. The practicing of continuous improvement, smart goal planning. I don't know if you went to smart training. I had to go to smart training. But I, I read an article that said a lot of people do not keep their New Year's resolutions. Do you keep your New Year's resolutions at all? The people who do are ones that say they don't actually make New Year's resolutions. <laughs> but the, the smart training, <laughs> no, I don't either unless it's like, don't make a resolution, don't make a, a resolution. Yeah, my New Year's resolutions, if I were to use smart, were closer to like Homer Simpson and like S-M-R-T, not S-M-A-R-T. Uh, no, they weren't really attainable. Don't make them. Yeah, stop trying. Right, right? And that's because we say things like uh, generic, like, ah, I want to make more money or I want to travel more or I want to, you know, do something fun with my life. It's like, hmm, <laughs> there's no way to actually attain it. Now, we don't always use a smart in retrospectives, but it is just one of those things that we do talk about. It's a best practice. So when we set the goals and close out the retro, whether they're S-M-A-R-T or S-M-R-T, uh, either way, we try and, and reflect on what's happened in the near past and what we're going to work on in the near future. And that's, that's the value of a retrospective. And I know a lot of people that come to Agile or never, ever done Agile before, sort of walk away thinking, wow, even on a predictive project, we could have a daily stand-up meeting. As long as it's not solution-oriented, go in circles, rabbit trails, all of that, we have regular meetings for that. And we can start to do retrospectives. So what do you think, those of you who are like super new to Agile or you're more going hybrid, what I, what I see in the industry now, and I've been doing this a very long time, what I'm seeing in the industry now is more and more people trying things. And some of you said, oh, you know, my team, they don't dig user stories. <laughs> I can't get them on board with that. There will be certain things where your team's like, nah, or your stakeholders don't want to do it, or your organization doesn't understand it. But it does take a little bit of time to practice some of these things. But most people do not have a hard time every two weeks having a retrospective at all. Hey, what was the last two weeks like? It's different from a status meeting. It's different from a progress meeting. It's more practicing continuous improvement. So the ACP, where did it come from? The Project Management Institute sends out every three years or so what are called role delineation studies. What that is, is a big old survey to project managers globally to find out what they're actually using as best practices. And they started to see, the PMI started to see more and more people were saying daily stand-ups, task boards. They, they started to see more agile and they went, whoa, okay, it's not just about predictive anymore. Th that ship is not sailed, but it's changed direction. And we need to get in front of this whole Agile thing. So their very first step into Agile was the Agile Certified Practitioner. And they pulled best practices from different principles, mindsets, and so on. This is the exam breakdown. It's 120 questions. But you can see you know, value-driven delivery, stakeholder engagement, team performance, adaptive planning. Oh, now they want a beach ball. You know, oh, now they want you know, a different font in their software. Okay. Whereas in predictive, we have this formal change control, you know, scope creep, all of that. It's a very different way of looking at work. It's a very different way of working. In a predictive environment, scope of work is usually fixed. 
we're building a bridge, we're building a bicycle. Whereas in Agile, we know we're building a virtual reality game with, you know, a Star Wars theme. But the features, the functions, the bugs that will come up against, the, you know, glitches in the matrix that we have to fix. So we're going to do it in a more emergent design, test it as we go, make sure everything works well together, and then release it. That doesn't mean it isn't buggy and we're not going to support it and all of that. We do. But it's ready to be released because it was an, an emergent design. Continuous improvement, problem detection resolution. We still have risk. We still have you know, quality problems, defects, and so on. But doesn't really matter the industry that you're in. There is room for Agile. And that's where PMI started to see this shift. And now, as mentioned, the PMP exam is 50% Agile and 50% predictive. So that hybrid workflow, and PMI actually worked with the Agile Alliance to create the ACP exam, what's also called the Agile Practice Guide, which if you're familiar with the PMP or the Project Management Body of Knowledge, that came out. That was their first sort of like, teams are in the messy middle ground but we were all shocked because I've had my PMP since 2007. It was full on predictive at that point. And we started to see this trend toward working with the Agile Alliance. And we thought, you know, PMI and the Agile Alliance working together? What? That could have never happened. And so this, this is the certification exam that was born from that. And then, of course, recently more updates to that Agile in project management and their exams and the content that we talk about in class. As far as the certification, as mentioned, not everybody comes to the class for the cert. You know, and, and I, there's no judgment. I'm like, mm. we talk about all the exam information on the very last day. So it's more of a workshop about agile and best practices. After it's over, if you decide you want to actually take the exam, once the class is over, you will have your what are called contact hours that are necessary to take the exam through PMI. Now, of course, if you want to get Scrum certified, you go through the Scrum Alliance. If you want to get SAFE certified, you go through their programs. You know, there's so many frameworks out there now that can be utilized in a lot of different industries that might resonate more. And that's why I like this content, because it allows us to take a look at a lot of different types of frameworks and be like, what's going to work best for us and for our team. So these are the requirements. We talk about it in class. If you already have your PMP, that, that covers your generalized project management experience. And they're just really looking for 1,500. Uh, Chris is asking, uh, how does the ACP exam compare to the PMP exam? Well, the ACP, as far as difficulty or content, the ACP exam is all agile. And the PMP is both predictive and agile questions. Uh, difficulty, the PMP is way more difficult than the ACP. Yeah, uh, way more difficult. <laughs> so, but it's not unattainable either. But the PMP is definitely going to have, you're welcome. And the PMP is more prestigious also, you know. Yes, you can take the ACP without the PMP, absolutely. Yep, you just have to document 2,000 hours of general project management experience in the last eight years, and then 1,500 hours of Agile. So you've got that. I mean, how, how long have you been working in project management? One thing that's kind of nice about the ACP is that you don't have to deal with the predictive side of anything, you know, because it is all Agile, for sure. And I, I would imagine WB probably could pass the exam today, <laughs> but you have to have the contact hours and go through class. What's nice about the classes for me, like what you see is what you get. I, this is just who I am. It's how I am in class. I like to have a dialogue. I don't want it to be a monologue. I know it's virtual training, but my job, my goal is to have a conversation, is for you to walk out of class and whether you get a certification or not, if you want to get the cert, I'm going to cheer you on. I'm going to be here to help you after class ends. I'll review your applications. I'll answer questions. I'll do whatever you need me to do to help you be professionally successful in that goal. However, if you decide not to get your ACP, you, it's, so that's fine. 
If you walk away with one, two, 10, 20 nuggets of things that you can use in your day to day on your projects that help you, awesome. That's awesome. So, how many hours? The hours with the ACP class is eight sessions and it's 16 hours total. So, two hours a day, Monday through Thursday. Usually, it depends, unless there's a holiday weird holiday thing going on where there's a Monday holiday or something like that. We'll go Tuesday through Friday. But yeah, it's eight sessions, 16 hours. Everything's recorded. There's additional content that you can have that, that's out there. Practice exams. And I wrote the study guide for Wiley Cybex for the ACP class. You have access to that. You also have access to the Wiley Cybex test bank site of practice questions that are out there for the ACP exam. So yeah, it's well-rounded, well-rounded for sure. And, you know, obviously it's an exam prep class. So my goal is to say, well, you could see this on the exam, but it's not like all exam hack. I mean, it's, it's, it's the content that can help you go back to work and say, you know, how, how can I implement some of these things? Yeah, basically you need a year of project management. Yep. Mm -hmm. Within the last eight years, pretty much. And project management can be anything. Like you could be a team member, maybe an accident, what I call an accidental project manager. You're good at your job and you get promoted. Or you're the IT manager working on projects. You don't have to have the, the label project manager. Projects are anything that are temporary and unique. And I, I help you with your applications. If you need me to, I can review them. I do that for all of my CERT classes. They have to fill out an application. I review it for them. Just make sure, yep, that looks legit. You can submit it. And uh, people really appreciate that because sometimes the applications can be more difficult than the actual exam. But this is what the exam is based on. However, I teach the class in the order of the chapters in the book, which is essentially the order of, quote unquote, loosely based on the order of an agile project because it's easier to learn that way than it is to say, okay, let's do all of this and then then circle back and rewind and remember four days ago when we... It's so confusing. I, I, people don't learn like that. And so the course is based on chapter one of your student guide so that you can go back after the fact and review it. One thing that I always tell my classes and I go back and forth with this to basically say, look, exams are perfect world. In a perfect world... We would do this exactly like this. And then we talk about the real world. How can we utilize some of these best practices in the real world? Here's how you answer the questions. Make sure you answer the question this way. But let's talk about how you could utilize you know, this in your real world. Because we're all in different industries. We all have different organizational processes. Our enterprise environments are different. You know, culture and our, our organizational structures and setups are different. What might work for one of us might not work for somebody else. And so having that conversation in class is absolutely imperative. In a perfect world, and then there was Cisco Touch. <laughs> right? I can't speak to that, but I, 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 I know. <laughs> but same thing here. In a perfect world, and then there's project management tests. Uh, yeah, it's always something that is going to be, let's keep it as generic as like out of the gray as possible for exams or make it even more confusing depending on who we're talking about. But at the same time, being able to have those conversations about what might work in your real world might be beneficial. And by the way, those contact hours never expire. So if you decide I'm not taking the exam this year and I got so many things going on, I don't want to. And then a year from now, you decide you want to take it reach out to me, ask me if anything's been changed or updated based on the content that you went through. And, you know, those credit hours don't ever expire. So you can use them until whenever. But what I would say is always reach out to me. So here's a couple things. If you're interested in some of the things that we've talked about, I hand out this video in class. It's called uh, Product Ownership in a Nutshell. And just make sure that when you click on it, you can get to it because it's an active link for me, but I want to make sure that you can get to it. That is an awesome video on the agile life cycle, if you will, from the perspective of a role called the product owner, which is about as close to a project manager, if you will, on an agile project. Um, and definitely check that out. It's, a, it's such a great 
overview video and it's pretty eye-opening on four people in class they're like oh that was cool if you don't know anything about agile it's it's worth your 14 minutes that it is as far as the exams you get practice exams yeah we talk about exam hacks and that kind of thing and how to be successful my peeps pass that's the good news uh, people are passing but either way, I'm there every step of the way. I don't like instructors that are like, okay, bye, your class is over, and you never hear from them or see them or talk to them again. I'm, I'm available to you. And actually, uh, if support, could you put my email address in the chat for everybody? Even if you reach out to me a year from now, that's my email address. Feel free to reach out with any questions about content or thank you, Colin content anything that you have questions about oftentimes because these are so fast as we go through them it's only an hour you think of something after the fact reach out to me shoot me an email and, and i give my email out to everybody um, that way you're able to get in touch with me if you need to i also teach everything else yeah i mean i i teach everything project management i teach so lean six sigma i teach microsoft i teach planner I teach project, I teach uh, all, everything that's on the project management side, including software. That's my, that's my gig. <laughs> that's my realm. I don't dabble in Cisco or anything else like that. I am the project management side of the house. If you are interested in getting your PMP, your certified associate in project management, if you're brand new to project management, the CAPM also has Agile on it. The new exam changes in January. And so the new content is out. We're authorized training partners for the PMP with PMI, and so we have their official content. And then on the ACP side of things, you've got you know the book, Wiley Cybex, practice questions, and so on. But Mike could hook you up. I would jot down Mike's email or telephone number. Definitely can can hook you up. Thanks, Colin. Yeah, is the ACP exam changing anytime soon? Chris is asking. We have not heard that the ACP is going to change at any time. It hasn't changed in several years. And I think PMI is working more on the PMP side and updating the CAPM side. And because the ACP is based on other frameworks, like Scrum hasn't changed, Extreme Programming hasn't changed. So we've heard nothing, no rumblings about the exam changing at all. Whatever content we'll have, though, because we're authorized training partners, we're registered education providers globally, we'd always have the most up-to-date content either way. So, yeah, whatever class you got into, that would be the exam that we would teach, too. So, yeah, well, thank you so much, everybody. I really appreciate you joining me on a Friday. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. Any content questions, I can answer. Everything else, Mike can answer. <laughs> like schedules and all of that. But if you have a content question or you just want to chat about something or does this count as experience, certainly let me know. I am also very cognizant of your time and I appreciate you joining me on a Friday. So I will say thank you so much for everybody here at Storm and Studios. We appreciate you joining us. I hope you have a fantastic holiday season. I know things are, are gearing up for the holidays. So please be safe out there. Have a great holiday season. And I look forward to seeing you in class, hopefully, sometime soon. Oh, you are all most welcome. Thank you so much and have a great rest of your week. Thanks. Bye.